Hello, welcome back to the Space School. Like always, with PPS, your favorite hangout place. Today, we're back with another Star Wars story. Before I go any further, there are two different things that I need to address. First things first. If you see a comment down below about something about a massage, that is not me. I know how to spell messages. That is a scammer. Please report them. I try to report them every time I see them, uh, but I can't be there all the time. And other thing is, this is a video about the sequels. Yes, I know. Watch the video before you comment something stupid. This is honestly one of my favorite stories. I come up with. It's been four days writing it, so please watch before you leave a stupid comment. And also, special thanks to our patrons, voice actors, and everyone else panel the Penny Patrol team. If you want a chance to win our next giveaway, watch to the end of the video and I'll tell you all about it because everyone that wins in a giveaway wins during a video. Our story begins as the Empire crumbles. The second Death Star was destroyed over the moon of Endor. It didn't seem to be the downfall or even the end of the Empire, but it did put the Empire into a great disarray. The Empire retreated from the destruction of the second Death Star, leaving hundreds of Imperial elite troopers on the forest moon of Endor to become prey for the overly psychotic, human-eating teddy bears. While the rebels created and celebrated this downfall of the Empire on Endor, it wasn't the end of the war. There was so much happening in the ever-changing galaxy, and while the rebellion celebrated the victory on Endor and the burning of Darth Vader's corpse shadowed over the party on Endor with Luke Skywalker, his sister, and friends all being present, the Empire retreated from the Forest Moon. Under the control of the fleet Admiral Rax, the Empire was set to follow a specific contingency plan that would harm Imperial loyal planets in the event that the Empire failed to protect its Emperor, which it obviously seemed to do. There was also a line of events that were meant to resolve and help give life to the Emperor after his death, a resurrection of sorts, though that was a long ways away from happening. Instead, the moment here, there were several Moff and Grand Admirals across the galaxy reacting to the death of the Imperial Hierarchy, that being Vader and the Emperor himself. With messenger droids being sent out across the galaxy to inform the higher-up Imperial leaders of the Emperor's demise, the galaxy was about to see the beginning of Operation Cinder. For the Rebellion, their determination to bring justice to the galaxy would be challenged when the Empire turned its weapons on its own civilians. Operation Cinder would see Burning Khan, Condavant, Amendendo, Kaminor, Narcosis, Vardos, and Naboo targets of the Imperial operation. Large weapons and side of satellites would shoot down onto these planets, disrupting any ecological balance on these planets. This was part one of a contingency plan meant to bring those loyal to the Emperor to pay for failing him. And then the Empire would be led by Admiral Rax to the unknown regions where the Empire would be rebuilt. Rax was one of few people Palpatine trusted with this power and this knowledge. He trusted Rax because he essentially raised him. Rax was much like a girl whose city is raised, though this particular girl was force sensitive and trained to use the dark side of the force. Her name was the Emperor's Hand, well that was her nickname at least, and she was meant to at some point be the replacement for Lord Vader, though that day seemed to have never come. At this particular moment, at the destruction of the second Death Star, Admiral Rex assumed the control of the entire Imperial military, while Mara Jade, the Emperor's Hand, had to figure out her role in the galaxy. Of course, her natural reaction was revenge. She would like to seek revenge against the Rebel Alliance, but for now, she couldn't do anything. The Rebels were rising, and they were everywhere. Mara decided her best bet would be to go to Palpatine's homeworld. There, she assumed that she would be able to find and follow her path. There had to be something on Naboo that she could use to guide her path forward. For now, she had to get there. The Empire was in shambles, and any rogue ship would be seen as a threat or as a rebel. So she made sure to link up with a fleet en route to Naboo. She found Captain Duvant, who was heading towards Naboo, and she also found her safest passage to the planet. Meanwhile, on Endor, Luke had just encountered the forced ghosts of his father, Ben Kenobi, and Master Yoda. He'd seen Ben several times, but Anakin, as himself, and Yoda were not forced ghosts that he was familiar with. After Luke turned around, he didn't see them again. The celebration on Endor lasted into the night, and in the morning, game faces were on. General Sandula and General Organa were already talking about the strategies for the coming days. Admiral Akbar, General Solo, and General Calrissian were also at this meeting. The Alliance had a bulk of its forces here on Endor, and they needed to split them up so that they could affect a larger area of the Empire and rally more systems to fight for freedom. 
their discussion would be cut short when Mon Mothma would request the bulk of leadership of the Alliance up to the Home One briefing room. There was an emergency that had to be dealt with immediately. It didn't take long for the Empire to start making moves, even after the catastrophe at Endor. When the group finally arrived inside of the ship, they were shown a hologram that would bring sadness to the hearts of every leader here. While their fight was against the Empire, and their intention was to take the fight to the Empire, and worlds loyal to it, this was an atrocity. Mon Mothma reported that several extremely loyal Imperial worlds had satellites outside of them, and those satellites were being present over the planets were shooting down onto them. Admiral Rax deployed several fleets to ensure that these planets suffered. Instead of Home 1, Hera Syndulla covered her mouth as she watched the Empire turn its weapons of mass destruction back on its own civilians. Of course, those inside of the Empire could see this as punishment that they deserved, or they would see this as a perfect reason to side with the Rebellion. On the other hand, the Alliance saw these atrocities as something they needed to act out against. It was ridiculous that the Empire chose its own citizens as targets for their weapons of mass destruction. The Alliance needed to split up and stop this operation before it claimed entire planets and destroyed people across the galaxy. It would take time. Leia, Lando, and Luke would take Group 1 to Naboo, where they would try and put an end to the Operation Cinder. Han, Chewie, and Rogue Squadron would go along with some winged MC-80s across the galaxy to Abendendo, and Admiral Akbar, alongside of Harris and Dula in Group 3, would strike closer to the heart of the Empire at the planet of Vardos. Three main battle groups would lead successful strikes across the galaxy. Especially if the Rebellion was seen as defending Imperial worlds from the Empire, it could be a great rallying cry for them. But first, the Rebel fleet needed to repair itself. It would take some time. The Rebels were done in a bit during the Battle of Endor, and now they had to rebuild their forces and repair their ships before they engaged with the Greater Empire across the galaxy. Luke was going to escort his sister and Lando to Naboo, and then from there, he would be going off on a trail with Lando to discover the secrets of the Jedi. Lando was interested in helping his friend with this task. Since Han Solo was in carbon freezing for almost a year, Luke became closer with this new ally. Lando knew some of the systems that may be of help to Luke, especially since Jokas Nu was killed during the Age of the Empire. It would be hard for a newcomer like Luke to find his way through the galaxy, finding whichever planets previously belonged to the Jedi. There was always a possibility that Kenobi, Yoda, or even Luke's father could help him, but Obi-Wan only ever dropped by when Luke needed to go somewhere or learn something, and Yoda and Anakin only appeared once during the celebration. It was unknown whether or not they would be more active than Kenobi in teaching and or showing Luke where to go. For the coming days, the Alliance fleet would rebuild its losses and gather more reinforcements over the forest moon of Endor. The Rebels also fought off any straggling Imperial forces over the moon. There were recon groups coming in looking for stragglers, and they were scared off when they encountered the entirety of the Rebel fleet. The Alliance fleet was very powerful, and they prepared to enter combat yet again. Admiral Akbar addressed the fleet. He gave an empowering speech as the three groups prepared to split off into combat. Han and Leia gave their love to one another as the twins and Lando made their move for Naboo. They were the first part of the fleet to dispatch into hyperspace. The other two groups were quick to follow as they went to their respective planets. The closest planet to Endor so happened to be Naboo, and so the rebels were entered into immediate combat against a smaller, weaker Imperial fleet. Captain Haldo got in contact with Leia, as she told her that the fleet over Naboo was smaller than it was before Endor, urging Leia, Lando, and Luke be aware of any traps that could come in to attack them. This notion was duly noted, as the rebel starfighters locked S-foils into attack position, lining up behind Luke and Lando as they moved in towards the smaller Imperial fleet. Captain Duvat, on the other hand, with three Imperial Star Destroyers, warned his fleet to prepare for combat, making sure all of the TIE Fighters launched into combat with the X-Wings heading towards them. This smaller fleet had no B-Wings or A-Wings, just the talent of Luke and Lando alongside some frigates and two MC-75s. This fleet moved in as they prepared a defense position, as the X-Wings cut through the path of TIE Fighters, allowing the Y-Wings in the back easy access. Some corvettes screeched across the battlefield as Captain Haldo moved her Nebulon B frigate into the firing line of three Star Destroyers. The shields on her small frigate wouldn't last long, but if she played this right, it would be the perfect diversion for the two heavier starships to begin their assault on the Star Destroyers. 
three dreadnoughts backed up the MC-75s as Luke spun his X-Wing over the combat and cut through several TIE fighters. Instead of Captain Duvat's flagship, he asked that the Emperor's hand retrieve some secret information from the throne room on the boom. It was located behind a sculpture of the former Emperor. It was important information that Admiral Rax would need if the Empire were to survive. Mara asked what it was, as Captain Duvat told her it was plans to turn an ancient homeworld of the Jedi, known as Ilum, into a superstructure. Mara was confused immediately as she asked if it was like the Death Star, and the captain nodded his head eagerly, like it was a great idea. Mara scrunched up her face confusedly as she asked why the Emperor would want to build another one after the first two failed so easily. Captain Duvat knew better than to question the Emperor as he told her that it was as the Emperor willed. Mara turned around as she thought about how stupid it sounded in her mind as her orange chair fluttered behind her. She made her way to the hangar bay and took a TIE Advanced V-1, the same model the former Inquisitorius used to use before they were all killed. She hopped into the Starfighter and made her way down to Thede. The city was heavily armed and prepared for besieging, though the people on the ground believed it was going to be the rebels, considering they were under siege since the destruction of the second Death Star. Many systems across the Empire weren't aware of this tragic loss, but Naboo, being a target of Operation Cinder, knew all too well that the Rebels were on the move. The Empire tried to frame Operation Cinder on the Rebels, but it was apparent that they weren't behind it, especially when the Rebels were coming out of hyperspace to stop this operation from rupturing planets across the galaxy. Luke, who was leading combat efforts in space, noticed this TIE advanced fighter leaving the capital ship towards the surface. Luke called over to Lando on the comm link as he asked him to follow him down to the surface. It seemed as if someone important was heading down to the surface for some no good. Lando smiled as he rolled the Lady Luck over some TIE bomber wreckage as he followed up behind Luke. Leia told the X-Wings to continue their attack on the TIE fighters. At the same time, the Y-Wings all split off into three formations, as they all three made simultaneous runs against the Star Destroyers, disabling all three of their shield generators and completely disabling Captain Duvat's flagship, as the MC-75s and Dreadnoughts made their aggressive attack on the Star Destroyers. The Imperial fleet was completely weakened as the Rebels made their push. Captain Holdo moved her frigate out of the way, as smoke could be seen bellowing out of the hull. Luke and Lando followed hot pursuit down to the surface, though they did this without being seen or noticed by the TIE advance they were following. The ship landed down inside of a hangar bay that was attached to the Thede Palace. Luke and Lando, when they breached through the clouds, immediately were under fire from the Imperial ground defense. Lando told Luke to get inside the hangar bay as he would cover him. Luke did so as he swung his X-Wing down at the hangar bay, destroying two turbo lasers on the way down. Just as his father would, Luke let the X-Wing slide across the ground as he ejected into an array of gunfire. R2 piloted the ship to a stop as Luke ignited his lightsaber and used the force to throw stormtroopers from their feet. Mara Jade, who had just exited her TIE advance, saw the cunning warrior. She looked relatively angry and she sent some royal guards to dispatch of Luke while she went to the throne room, as Captain Dubot said to do. Luke kept his black hood over his head as he moved like a tornado of absolute power and prowess, cutting through stormtroopers and using the force to disarm others. Luke spun around in a formidable fashion as he cut through two royal guards with ease. R2 ejected to watch his master of lightsaber work at go to work, while at the same time, Lady Luck landed in the hangar bay. Luke turned around and smiled when he heard Lando ask if he had left anyone behind for him. Lando's blue cape flapped in the wind as R2 and him followed behind this Jedi. The same Jedi that had only defeated the legendary Darth Vader a mere few days before. Luke and Lando went through the hallways as Luke felt the presence of this force user he encountered. He had no idea that Vader or the Emperor had an apprentice, but it seemed to be the case as he felt hot on the trail. Luke turned around corners as he picked up speed, with Lando and R2 on his trail. Luke made his way around a corner as he ducked, a red light's like a red lightsaber jabbed at him inside of the throne room. It was Mara Jade, but she didn't know he was an adversary. Luke didn't know who she was, but he did want to know. Mara swung violently at Luke as he blocked her blade and pushed her back with the force. She growled at him as Lando and R2 ran into the room only to look at each other and step back out, out of the room. This was not the fight for the two of them to be involved with. 
Mara demanded that Luke leave her alone. As Luke demanded, she revealed who she was. The two stood in their defense positions at the opposite ends of the room as they looked at each other for a moment. Maybe it was a passing fancy, or maybe just a moment of pure admiration for the other. The two were very clearly in their primes, but that didn't excuse this close encounter. Luke stepped to the side, asking if Mara worked for the Emperor. She thought for a moment. He was dead, but he did raise her. Though she didn't fully agree with the idea of building another Death Star into a planet. The point of killing planets was meaningless to her. It was not absolute power, rather it was just a means of control through fear to her. That was all Mara knew though. She was taught to fear Vader and allow that fear to consume her so that she may strike him down in anger someday. Mara kept close watch on Luke as she pointed her blade towards him, almost as if she was backed into a corner. Luke noticed this and he also noticed her clear connection to the dark side, but much like his father, she wasn't pure evil. There wasn't the vile nature that Sidious had. There was something pure, maybe even compassionate. Luke lowered his weapon and as he did, four purge troopers stormed the room as Luke turned around and defended himself from them. They struck at him as he danced between their staves. Mara ran towards the sculpture of her former master as she got behind it and got a hold of the plans. She began to run for the exit as she took one last look at Luke before she ran out the doors. Though as the door opened, she was slammed gut first into a metal object. Her lightsaber and the disc holding all the information on Project Starkiller Base, flew from her hands and jumped across the floor. She looked down in anger, and then from the side of her vision she saw a tall, darker man as he smiled with pearly white teeth and said to her to have better luck next time as he stunned her with his gun. Luke, in the hall, cut through the remaining guards and then turned around to see the woman pass out on the ground. Lando looked over and smiled at Luke as he looked down to the ground to see what was on the disc. Luke picked Mara up as a blaster fire began filling the hallways of the palace. It was Imperial Stormtroopers. Lando and Luke jumped behind cover as Luke laid Mara down gently and grabbed his blaster. Lando and Luke stood behind the massive pillars that coated Luke's mother's palace. Stormtroopers tried to land their shots on the two rebels, but it was no use. Luke then ignited his lightsaber and used the lightsaber to block the shots and shoot them back at the Stormtroopers. The hallways were filled with stormtroopers as Luke and Lando were clearly pinned down. In space, the rebel forces made short work of the remaining Imperial fleet, as the Y-Wings and X-Wings began to make bombing runs on the satellites that were causing so much damage to Naboo's atmosphere. Once the satellites were destroyed and the Imperial reinforcements retreated from the battlefield, rebel fighters made their way down into the atmosphere as they escorted tons of ancient LAATs from the Clone Wars down. The rebels weren't stingy about their usage of starships and essentially anything they can get their hands on. The ships made their way down to the surface as it began to get under heavy flak. The rebels avoided combat as they tried to get down to the surface. The X-Wings made their way across the city, striking down turbo lasers, AT-ATs, and ATSTs. There were tanks on the ground that were still shooting up, but the palace began to rattle with the sounds of artillery and explosions. It was clear that the rebels were here. U-Wings also made their way down behind X-Wings as they made their striping runs against Imperial military members. The Rebels were trying to get the Empire to surrender, but the heavy fire was dissuading the Rebels that the Empire would surrender. Inside of the palace, Luke kept fighting side by side with Lando, as stormtroopers kept piling into the massive hallways as smoke filled the air. Mara's eyes shot open as ringing filled her ears. She looked at Luke and then raised her hands as she threw him from his feet. Mara grabbed her lightsaber and shakily stood up as she ignited it, though she was caught completely off guard when her arm was shot by an Imperial Stormtrooper. She was knocked from her feet as she tumbled to the ground in pain. Luke looked over and then ran towards her, sliding across the pristine floor as he made his way over to make sure she was alright. Mara gritted her teeth as she gripped her lightsaber. Luke looked at her as he raised his eyebrows, suggesting she keep her blade down. Luke then ducked as his blaster fire flew over his head. He stood up and raised his blaster and began shooting into the hallway. R2 then filled the hallway with smoke as Lando turned around and told Luke to go. R2 started spinning around in circles as smoke filled the air, covering their tracks. Luke got next to Mara Jade as he reached his hand down, telling her that she had the option to join him. Mara looked up as Luke as Luke blocked blaster fire shots with his lightsaber. He pushed his hand down again, telling her that the stormtroopers would probably kill her if she stayed behind. She growled as she reached up and took Luke's hand. The two of them made their way into the throne room, as they looked for a means to escape the palace. The palace overlooked a massive waterfall and an even larger drop. 
The best way to escape was back through the hangar, which was clearly blocked off. The palace began to shake again as cannons nearby exploded into a fire blaze. Stormtroopers in the hallway could be heard turning their attention away from the blaster fire as it echoed throughout the palace, as the three stood side by side in the throne room, hearing stormtroopers call for reinforcements as they were cut down. An elite group came through the doors as they noticed the three standing there. The first one took off his helmet as he smiled with an aging smile and gray long hair. He told them that they were the Bad Batch. They were here looking for Luke Skywalker. Luke smiled and stepped forward, giving a firm handshake as he kept a close eye on Mara Jade to make sure she didn't do something stupid. The Bad Batch told them that they were here trying to help liberate the planet of Naboo. Luke told them that they needed to get back to the fleet. Hunter told Luke that they won the space battle and then reported that General Sola's fleet had just engaged the Empire in Albendendo, and Admiral Akbar was still currently in hyperspace. Hunter then told the group to make their way to the hangar bay and they would cover them on their way there. Luke looked at Mara. He told her that she was free to go if she wanted, though he knew that she wanted the potential for more if she wanted to join him. Mara's face stuttered. She didn't know what to do. All she'd ever known was the Empire but it seemed as if the Empire had betrayed her, and that she was all alone. She looked at Luke and saw him as an escape from the Empire, but how could the Rebellion feel if he brought back essentially the Emperor's daughter? She may not have been well known to those outside of the Empire, but it seemed by the Stormtrooper shooting her that she wasn't really all that well known to anybody. Her master told her a lot of things. He told her that she would rise in Vader's place, and she would rule the Empire side by side with him. But the unstoppable power that was Sidious seemed to be ended by Vader, which was then ended by Luke. Mara stood in her tracks, as if her feet were cemented to the ground. She looked almost lost. Luke had two options, leave her to the will of the dark side, or take her on a journey with him and Lando as they went to discover the roots of the Jedi. It was entirely possible that Luke could train Mara in the ways of the light side when he himself was learning the way of the Jedi while voyaging across the galaxy. It also meant another thing. It meant that if Mara could also accompany Luke instead of Lando, which it would allow the newly appointed general the ability to assist the Alliance on battlefronts across the galaxy. Luke, just as he had before, reached out his hand to Mara as she looked down at the hand. Her hand hovered over her lightsaber as she looked at him. Luke trusted her to be a better person than that who raised her. The question is, if she really was that person, would she really take his hand or would she take it off? Luke looked at Mara as the Bad Batch moved into the hallway to fight off more stormtroopers as the palace continued to shake. Lando and R2 followed the old group of clone troopers into the hallway. Mara looked at Luke's hand and then looked up into Luke's eyes, which were still locked onto hers. She pushed his hand away as she stepped forward and looked into his eyes as she told him that she could walk on her own. As she pushed Luke forward, Luke looked at her and then turned around as he started moving. Luke caught up to Lando and R2 and the Bad Batch as he and Mara made their way to the hangar bay. Luke would have R2 pilot his X-Wing while he, Lando, and Mara would take Lady Luck back up to the capital ship above. Over Abandando, Han Solo and the Millennium Falcon led a group of fighters into combat. The fleet had a couple of quasars that would deploy countless numbers of fighters. This raid of this raid with Rogue Squadron and Han Solo would be significantly focused on fighter heavy combat and frigates. There wasn't too much in the way of capital ships other than two winged MC-80s. These ships would take up the bulk of the damage, while the frigates and quasars would deploy their ships and then move out of the combat zone. The rebels were quick to deploy once they exited hyperspace. The fleet above Abendendo was very similar to the one over Naboo, though there were five Star Destroyers present. With five Star Destroyers, the rebels had to be quick to snuff out any resistance from the Imperial fighters. X-Wings, A-Wings, and Y-Wings all formed up behind Rogue Squadron and the Millennium Falcon as they all entered battle. The Rebel pilots and their fighters were superior to that of the Empire as they cut through wings of TIE Fighters. Captain Raddus, the son of Admiral Raddus, called up some cruisers for an assault. He remembered a plan his father had at the Battle of Scarif as he ordered every single Y-Wing to focus on the Star Destroyer on the further side of the Imperial flank. The Rebel fighters were elite without a doubt, and the Millennium Falcon, here, they were nearly unstoppable as a force, as an ace wing of TIE fighters barreled out of the hangar bay of the capital ship in the middle of the Imperial lines. The ace squadron focused down the Millennium Falcon, as Han and Chewie broke off from the main group of rebels while the battle ensued behind them. The Falcon spun in circles as Nia Num in the rear cannon shot back at the Imperial aces. 
Han piloted the ship expertly as he whipped it around and around. At the same time, the Y-Wings landed their shots. Captain Raddus commanded some hammerhead corvettes into the far flank of the Imperial lines, as the Star Destroyer was completely disabled by the wings of Y-Wings. The Rebels saw the opportunity as Rogue Squadron abandoned the fighter fight and got into combat strictly with the satellites trying to do as much damage as they could before the satellites of Operation Cinder destroyed the planet below. As the hammerhead corvettes flew up to the side of the Imperial flank, both of them moved towards the stern of the disabled Star Destroyer, as they both pushed the ship into the corresponding ships next to it. It created a massive dysfunction in the Imperial ranks as Star Destroyers began to collide with one another, creating massive explosions in space. Simultaneously, the satellites began to crumble, but there was an issue. The Millennium Falcon was still being tracked. Wedge Antilles broke off from the main group as he backed up the Millennium Falcon and shot down a couple of the aces. With several more aces following closely, a group of A-Wings were dispatched as they screamed across the air and shot lasers into the backs of the Thai squadron. Over Naboo, Luke, Lando, and Leia reconvened on the capital ship. Mar was outside of the room with two guards standing next to her. The three inside the command deck began to talk about what the plans for the next battle were. Lando told Leia that there were several other Imperial planets facing these satellites, and the chances of those planets being destroyed were entirely likely. Leia agreed, as she told the command deck to prepare for an assault on one of the corresponding planets. Since this was one of the smaller fleets, they had to be careful of where they invaded. Captain Haldo told Leia that scouts reported Commodore to be one of the safer planets to visit, to save. Mara Jade from outside the room could hear this conversation, but stayed silent. Luke wished that the Force be with them, but he couldn't follow them on this journey. He was going to take the woman he met on Naboo with him to discover the ways of the Jedi. Leia was very obviously concerned with this because she didn't know if Luke would return alive from this mission or not. Though Luke reassured his sister that he would be back to join her and their friends again. Leia trusted that Luke would be successful as she watched her twin walk out of the command deck and tap Mara Jade on the shoulder and begin to walk with her into the halls. Luke and Mara walked side by side through the capital ship as she told Luke that the rebels on Vardos were about to get crushed. Luke asked why she would say that, as she told him that Admiral Rax was gathering up troops from across the core on Vardos before moving them out to the sand planet of Jakku, where they would hold their ground and begin a regiment in strict training in preparation for the downfall of the Rebellion. The Empire still had other Super Star Destroyers across the galaxy, and currently Admiral Rax was over Vardos inside of one of them. Luke looked at Mara's eyes and then asked if she was serious. She nodded. Luke looked at her and then back into the briefing room as he ran over and opened the doors, barging in. Leia, Lando, and Haldo all looked at him as he told them that Akbar and Sindula were heading into a trap. Leia asked how she knew this, and Mara walked in behind Luke as she shooed off the two rebel guardsmen that were trying to escort her. She told Leia that the Empire had a massive fleet over Vardos. Luke asked how quickly they could get there. Leia told them that they wouldn't be there soon enough. Though, on the other hand, Han Solo could get there and supply the necessary fighter reinforcements to aid the rebel assault. Leia turned on the hollow device in the center of the room and watched as Han Solo and Chewie popped up. Han smiled with a witty smile as he looked at Leia and then over to Lando, Holdo, Luke, and this red-haired woman that stood next to him. He spoke up telling them that they had successfully routed the Empire over at Ambendendo. Then, they were going to plan on moving over to the next star system and head over to Kaminor. Leia stopped him there. She said that the Empire was grouping up at Vardos, where Admiral Akbar and General Sindula were heading. They would need reinforcements immediately, because they were walking into a trap. Han understood as he told Chewie and Nian Dum to contact the fleet and move them into hyperspace towards Vardos. Han told the group to have the Force be with them as he ended the communication. The Millennium Falcon and the rest of the secondary group moved quickly into hyperspace, hoping to catch the Empire off guard with rebel reinforcements. Leia thanked Mara again as she prepared to get in contact with Admiral Akbar and warned him that he was walking into a trap as well. Akbar would be grateful when he received the information regarding the Imperial fleet as he prepared his forces for a diamond formation. It would be hard for coming out of hyperspace, but if Akbar could move his fleet into this diamond formation, the chances were very likely that they could survive the onslaught of another Super Star Destroyer. Instead of the MC-75, Leia was preparing her fleet to move out towards Vardos to provide any additional reinforcements to Admiral Akbar. Luke and Mara, on the other hand, were walking out into the hangar bay. Luke was giving her praise for being brave enough to give that information to the Rebellion. She nodded her head to the appraisal, 
as Luke pointed her towards an X-Wing. She looked at it and then to Luke, who climbed a ladder into his. She spoke up asking if he really trusted her. Luke smiled gently. He didn't know if he could trust her, but this would be a great way to find out if he could. She grinned and then asked where they were going. Luke said that they were going to head to Ilum. There they would be able to get an idea of the former Jedi Order. Of course Mara knew what was going to happen at Ilum, but she stayed silent. The disc that Lando and Luke recovered from her hadn't been analyzed yet, so there was no reason to believe that Luke would be in any danger on his route to Ilum. The two got into their X-Wings as they took off and left the hangar bay, as the MC-75 and the rest of the fleet jumped into hyperspace. Luke and Mara set their coordinates for Ilum and then jumped into hyperspace themselves. Within the coming hours, Admiral Akbar's fleet would arrive out of hyperspace into the space above Vardos, where Akbar would from his fleet command, form the fleet into a diamond formation, putting home one in the middle of the fleet, having winged MC-80s surround the massive ship, keeping it all the corvettes and anti-fighter ships in the middle, and then all the cruisers and frigates bringing up the end. The fleet here looked to be the remnants of what was at Endor, plus what Vardos already had to offer. Harris and Duel led the fighters around the fleet, as they made their way to protect the entirety of the fleet from TIE fighters and TIE bombers. The Imperial fleet that the Rebels were facing had a Super Star Destroyer of its own, and an assortment of Star Destroyers that were both battle damaged from Endor and fresh off the assembly line of the Kuat drive yards. Akbar knew this would be a struggle, especially with a Super Star Destroyer turning its cannons to face the Rebel fleet. The battle was underway though when wings upon wings of TIE fighters got into combat with Harris and Dula's forces and the Rebel fleet. Akbar knew all too well he had to be careful with this approach. The fleet needed to keep a tight perimeter. Akbar's fleet was the main bulk of the force that assaulted Endor, but taking down another Super Star Destroyer was never an easy task. Admiral Rax on the other side of the battlefield knew this wasn't the right moment to take down the Rebel forces. Across the galaxy over the planet of Ilum, there stood a silent vessel. Luke and Mara came upon it as they exited hyperspace. There was a great level of concern over the ship, and Mara recognized it. But it was decommissioned months before Luke joined the fight against the Empire. The two moved to board the vessel as Mara again kept her mouth shut. She was just as surprised to see a Star Destroyer out here as Luke was. Even though she knew the Empire was planning to do with the planet of Ilum, it wouldn't be for a while. Luke and Mara moved into the hangar bay and landed. Before getting out, Luke made R2 check to see if the ship was still currently using its life support system. R2 told Luke that the life support system was off everywhere inside the ship other than that of the bridge. Luke got R2 to jump out and turn it back on. Mara and Luke waited patiently as the life support system boosted back up and the lights above flickered on and then off. Most of the systems on the ship seemed to be offline. Luke and Mara hopped out of the X-Wing and they looked at each other and then to R2 who had a little flashlight on. Luke ignited his lightsaber as Mara did the same with him. Luke looked over at Mara as she made a face and then asked if there was something on her face. Luke smiled and then shook his head as he stepped forward. R2 led the two of them down a corridor. The ship croaked and creaked. It was old and completely decommissioned. Luke stumbled over something as he caught himself and looked down. It was a stormtrooper, but his helmet was removed and his face was sucked dry as skin and bone couldn't be recognizable from sight. Mara looked down and then back up to Skywalker. She said it must have been from the life support system being turned off for so long. The coldness of space must have ripped through the crew, exposing them and killing them off slowly. Luke and Mara started to walk through the corridors again, watching their step, trying not to disturb the dead. The two of them crept along slowly as they found a hallway that led to some sparkling circuits. Luke told Mara they shouldn't go that way. There had to be a stairwell that they could use to climb up towards the bridge. Mara pointed her blade forward as Luke and Mara made their way towards where she would believe it would take them to be. The ship was an older model Star Destroyer, but they eventually found their way up to the stairwell and then made their way towards the bridge of the capital ship. Mara and R2 got close to the door as they then heard voices. Mara's face was covered in white. She recognized the logo on the bottom of the ship, but she assumed with the death of the rest of the crew that Thrawn would have been dead as well. That was obviously not the case as a door shot open and Thrawn and the rest of the bridge crew were holding a younger man captive. The entire bridge crew looked weakened, as if they had woken from a long rest. It seemed as if they were kept alive in some sort of frozen stasis while the rest of the crew was left to perish. Thrawn looked over, as did Ezra Bridger. 
They were both very confused, though they both did know one thing. They both knew that the Battle of Thal had certainly come to an end, and that they were no longer in the Thal anymore. The bridge windows were sealed shut, and there were some large tentacles inside of the bridge. It looked as if the bridge's windows were destroyed and sealed up after closing off whatever beasts were outside the windows. Thrawn looked at Mara as he spoke up, and then she silenced him. She didn't want to hear it. She was never fond of Thrawn. War Tarkin. Growing up with the Emperor meant she had to be around a lot of icy individuals. This cold icy man known as Thrawn was a nice puppet for Palpatine to use in his galactic scale plan, especially since Thrawn was loyal and he was extremely talented in the skills of battlefield strategy. While Mara wasn't exactly a Jedi or anything close to a rebel, being around Luke was calming. If she knew that Luke turned Vader against the Emperor, she would have understood why. He had the warmest essence in the Force, at least the warmest that Mara had ever felt. It was calming, and to an extent it brought her happiness, though that happiness ended when she locked eyes with the Chiss Master strategy. Ezra, on the other hand, was extremely confused why an apparent Sith and Jedi were working together, but he didn't say anything as he sat there quietly. Mara took a stand before Luke as she told Thrawn that this was the end of the road for him. Thrawn looked around confusedly, and then he grinned. He knew all too well how Mara was trained, and he was going to take full advantage of his knowledge of her past. Mara swung her blade forward as Thrawn caught her hand, and landing a striking kick to her stomach, he threw her off balance. Luke stepped forward as Mara told him to stay back. This was a match between Thrawn and her. No one else had any right to get involved in this confrontation. Ezra looked over at Luke, who gestured for him to join him. Ezra jumped to his feet as he ran over and got next to Luke as a few Imperials on the bridge tried to stop him. Luke threw them back with the Force as he and Ezra stood side by side. Mara then kicked at Thrawn, who caught her foot and twisted her around and shoved her to the ground. He then mocked her. For being the student of the Emperor himself, she was a sad sight to see. So much raw potential just for her to throw her lot in with the Jedi, a much weaker group of people. Thrawn spoke, saying that there was only one Jedi whom he respected, but these men before her were not that man. Anakin Skywalker was a fine Jedi, but to Thrawn, he made sure that Mara remembered her past, playing his mind games, and he made sure her anger grew, as she ran towards him trying to stop him from speaking, but he already won, as he soccer punched her in the throat. Thrawn turned around, tapped into the ship's systems, and then the floor opened up from under him. An alarm began to sound throughout the entire ship. Thrawn was going to have his ship self-destruct as he escaped killing the three supposed Jedi. It was brilliant, but Thrawn had no idea how much time he had lost having been stuck in stasis for so long. Once inside the hangar bay, he took a TIE Advanced V1 and escaped into the hyperspace. Inside of the bridge, Luke got a hold of Mara as he told the boy that they needed to escape. Mara was struggling to breathe, as one who normally does after being punched in the throat, as Luke got a hold of her and guided her forward. The four made their way through the Chimera and out into the hangar bay. There were a few TIE fighters that looked operable, as Ezra told Luke and Mara that he would try to make one of them work. The four made their way to the respective ships as they took off from the Chimera, and it ripped itself to shreds above Ilum. The three starfighters made their ways down into the planet below, and they were going to regroup and learn who each other was. Over Vardos, the battle heated up. Admiral Rax was prepared to make his grand escape, as he and the rest of the fleet was going to move towards Jakku and rebuild there. The Imperial fleet could certainly manhandle this rebel fleet, but Admiral Akbar's tactics made the rebels have a fighting chance, as the bulk of their fleet took all the shots from the Super Star Destroyer. Meanwhile, Harrison Dula led the fighters on a counter assault against the Super Star Destroyer. Most of the Imperial fighters couldn't break the Rebel lines, and with the Alliance pride and morale through the roof, there was very little to no chance that the Rebels would succumb to a morally weakened Imperial force. Admiral Rax realized that he lost the fighter superiority, and was ready to pull the bulk of his fleet out of combat, until his scopes picked up a pocket of Rebels coming into Vardo's space. As it turned out, General Solo and Rogue Squadron had arrived with two more heavily armed starships and a massive array of starfighters. The Rebels were going to work as fast as they could to tear through this Imperial operation. Solo and Syndulla got into comms chat with one another as they devised a plan after Hera thanked Solo for showing up. Admiral Akbar realized that these two winged MC-80s and the rest of the Rebel fleet over on the far flank were in severe jeopardy of being targeted by the Empire. Admiral Akbar knew that Rax would spot them and make them a target, 
though luckily Rogue Squadron was present and most of the Imperial fighter force was knocked out of the fight. Admiral Akbar ordered the fleet to break formation and spread out, making Home One the center target to the Super Star Destroyer. All five squadrons of B-Wings would then follow up Harris and Dula and two squadrons of Y-Wings as they would make their attack runs on the Super Star Destroyer before it took down any of the Rebel ships. There was one issue though. Because the Rebel fleet broke diamond formation, several of the light cruisers could become targets for the Star Destroyers and that of the Imperial fleet. Akbar was hoping that they wouldn't be targeted as he moved Home 1 into a position to be the main target. Home 1 was the largest ship in the fleet and it had the most shields. The Empire was caught in the middle of a firefight and then Admiral Rax realized he was in trouble when the onslaught of Rebel bombers began ripping through the shields of his Super Star Destroyer. The Imperial fleet was holding well, but a bombing run of this magnitude would have any ship in the fleet bracing for impact. The truth was that at Endor, the Imperial fleet was too vast and the Rebels had to specifically be able to target the Executor. Here at Vardos, the numbers were in favor of the Alliance as they made their attack on the Super Star Destroyer. The Rebels were in prime position to favor Victor as Syndulla and the Ghost and Solo and the Falcon pulled their starships around and began blasting through layers of starship that were exposed when the SSD lost its shields. Admiral Rax was in a state of terror as he began to try and pull the fleet out of combat. Of course, trying to sacrifice his Star Destroyers, he moved them out of the fence position to get over top of the Super Star Destroyer and defend it from all incoming fighter attacks. The Rebels moved in with precise speed and prowess. Admiral Rax's panic could be felt as the first Star Destroyer with a clear path to leave abandoned the battlefield to regroup at Coruscant rather than Jakku. It was apparent this entire operation was going to fail, and it was because of Rax. Moments later, he was blockaded as General Organa left hyperspace and the Imperials were boxed in. Rebel bombers changed targets from the shields of the Super Star Destroyer to its engines, in hopes to disable the ship enough to take it over for themselves. It would be a hassle, but if done correctly, it could secure the Alliance a useful ship. Admiral Akbar had other plans though. He knew a landing party would never be able to successfully take over a Super Star Destroyer. The crews were too large. Instead, stealing a prize ship from the Kuat Drive Yards would be a fair choice for the rebellion rather than trying to do it here. The Star Destroyers and captains of the Imperial fleet entered a complete state of chaos as they realized there was no escape for them. Their panic led to them smashing into one another because Rax moved the fleet out of position. With insupporting the captains and crews full of inept individuals, the fleet began to sort itself out by crashing into one another, creating a massive wreckage field that Rax wouldn't be able to escape from. It made no difference, as one of the Star Destroyer's broken hulls began to crusade its way through space towards Rax's Super Star Destroyer. The Rebellion then moved all of its fighters to take care of the satellites shooting down on the Vardos. At the same time, the Rebel cruisers began to rain fire down on the remaining Imperial ships as the Super Star Destroyer began to implode from the impact of the crashing Star Destroyer. Chaos filled the Imperial ranks as Operation Cinder began to crumble before their eyes. It was an obvious victory for the Rebellion, but the United Fleet had more plans to save such planets as Burn Khan, Condavant, Kaminor, and Narcosis. The main bulk of the Imperial Fleet wasn't present on any of the remaining planets, but the Rebellion would have to move swiftly if they wanted to save the star systems from falling to the evil plans of Operation Cinder. The victory was sift and decisive here on Bardos, though time would tell if it would be the same on the other Imperial planets. At the same time, the three landed on Ilum, as R2 popped out of the X-Wing and treaded along behind Mara, Luke, and Ezra. The three of them were starting to get to know each other, as Ezra told Luke who he was and where he was from. Luke spoke up saying that he'd heard about him and how brave his master was for saving General Syndulla. Ezra smiled, but the death of Kanan seemed all too recent. In reality, it had been four years since the fall was saved from the clutches of the Empire. Ezra had a lot of catching up to do, but before this group could carry on trying to learn more about one another, they saw a downed ship. It was clear this ship had been here for at least a decade. Luke, Mara, and Ezra walked in as R2 whistled and beeped at Luke, explaining to him that he had been on the ship before. Luke was confused as he listened to what R2 had to say. The ship was a former Jedi ship though it dated back to nearly a thousand years in age. The ship was used by Professor Huyang to help Jedi students forge their own lightsabers once they adopted their kyber crystals on Ilum. Luke's jaw dropped as he walked in and saw minimal damage on the inside of the ship. Luke, assuming Huyang was a Jedi, was surprised when the only passenger on the ship was an ancient bipedal droid. The droid was currently offline, most likely from not having any power for the longest time. But R2 began messing with the circuitry inside of the ship 
he found that it had enough battery to start up again. As R2 got the ship started, Professor Huyang shot into existence once again. He spoke and noticed the people in front of him. He was excited. It seemed as if the Jedi were back, though a bit of fear rang out over him. He saw Luke wearing all black. Professor Huyang knew all too well the last Jedi who wore all black. The last Jedi who wore those kind of robes slaughtered every single person out of the Jedi Temple. Professor Huyang asked who the young man was. Luke gave him his full name. Professor Huyang gasped as he asked who his father was. Luke told the droid teacher that his father was Anakin Skywalker. Mara looked over and so did Ezra. Mara had heard the name before, but she never really understood who it was. Sidious didn't talk about Anakin all too often. He looked at Luke with seriousness and then confusion. How is it possible that Anakin could have had a son, considering what Ahsoka had said back in the day? Luke looked back and forth as he assured everyone in the room he was going to reinstate the Jedi Order as a peacekeeping order in the galaxy. Professor Hiang was the most relieved to hear this. Luke asked Professor Hiang if he could help them rebuild this Jedi Order. The old droid saw this as poetic, that the father destroyed the Order and the son wanted to rebuild it. The professor agreed to help Luke, but there was a lot that Luke needed to learn before he could just become Grand Master of a new Order. But after hours of conversation, both Mara and Ezra would come to learn of the death of Master Yoda but also hear and learn what it was for Luke to do and what he wanted to do with this Jedi Order. It would differ from what Mara was told about the Jedi by Sidious, and it would significantly differ from what Ezra was taught by his master Kanan Jarrus. Luke told everyone that there were Jedi at lost amongst the stars, and if they could build an academy for the Jedi, then it was entirely possible that they could rekindle a lost order. Professor Hyang was honored that he could help rebuild this order. But first, they needed to choose a planet from thousands. Luke made it clear to the professor he wanted to avoid interaction with the Empire. He knew of something that had vanished as the war heated up, but there was something called the Path. It existed during the early years of the Empire, but it began to fade just as the Empire cracked down on it, as the war heated up. Professor Hiang hadn't heard of the Path, but he assured Luke that there were several remote worlds that would suffice for a Jedi Academy. The professor told the group about several planets, many of which being either Coruscant, Tython, Lothal, Dantooine, Octu, or Jeddah. Luke informed the professor that Jeddah had been blown half to hell by the Death Star four years before. The droid still had no clue what this meant, but he carried on saying that the Yavin system would be a fine place to build a temple. Professor Hiang then brought up a couple of other planets that might be a good fit, one being Mapuzo and the other one being Jebim. Luke told the droid that those planets were both planets of the former path. But the Empire took them over, and overcrowded them with stormtroopers to ensure that Jedi didn't pass through ever again. Ezra suggested to Luke that they use Lothal. There were several places that the Jedi could use to connect with the Force and the Greater Force on Lothal. Of course, it could sound biased from Ezra to go to his home world, but in all actuality it was a great choice. There was already a Jedi Temple present on the planet, and even more than that, there was a portal to the world between worlds. Luke and Professor Hyang looked at Ezra as if he had seven heads. Mara smiled and then realized what the others were confused about. She spoke up for the first time explaining that her master was extremely obsessed with the world between worlds. He studied the Force and he tried to get his best into it for some dark deeds, but he never really explained it all that much to her. Ezra obviously wasn't too fond of Mara because she was a student of Sidious, but he knew better than to jump to conclusions. He was a well-spoken young man, and it was decided by Luke that they would all go to Lothal. Having a local would certainly help the Jedi Order grow. With the objective planet being Lothal, the old cruiser would load up the two X-Wings, and then they would make their way to Lothal. The journey to Lothal would be informational for everyone. Mara wasn't entirely on board with being a Jedi, mostly because Professor Hyang made it sound awful especially with their code and everything. But Luke and Ezra, they had an idea of it and what they could change regarding the code, though that change would have to come from the one who would become Grand Master of this new Jedi Order. That Grand Master would obviously be Luke. On Coruscant, Grand Admiral Thrawn would return after four years of hiatus, being gone in deep space. The state of the Empire was much different than it was when he left it years before, but he could work with it. The only thing he needed was absolute control, over the Empire, and he would do that by assuming the role of Emperor, 
with full militaristic control of the Empire, he would come to learn that despite the disliking of the first Death Star, there was a second one that was built and destroyed. He also learned of Palpatine's plans in case he died, and Thrawn didn't necessarily care for them. There was no reason for the Empire to falter because of the leader dying. There would be no reason for Starkiller Base, no retreat to Exegol, no final stand on Jakku. Thrawn would do this right, and with Admiral Rax dead at the Battle of Vardos, Thrawn would order all satellites enacting Operation Cinder to halt their firing on the friendly planets. Thrawn would then request the highest level members of the Empire to Coruscant, where they would regroup. The core was the most important and crucial defense point for the Empire. The citizens were most loyal in the core, and the largest factory worlds of Corellia and Kuat were present. If the Empire was to survive, Thrawn would need to be brought up to date on everything that had happened. Luke would learn of this Luke Skywalker, only to realize that he had faced him down several hours beforehand. At the same time, Thrawn would also learn the power in the Rebels and how they grew so powerful in such a short period of time. He respected it highly. But he also knew this meant that as leader of the Empire, he would need all the military leaders in charge to be leaders, not boys playing with toys. Thrawn noticed that after every successful Imperial assault, a couple of leaders would get out of hand. While the Emperor tolerated it, Vader did not, and with Vader dead, it meant that Thrawn would not tolerate insubordination either. If an officer acted out of line, they would be executed, and someone mature enough to lead without trying to compete with someone on the same team would fill their role. Thrawn had maybe weeks to pull together this fledgling empire and make sure that it wasn't overtaken by the rebels. The best part is that Thrawn had an element of surprise. No one knew he returned. Thrawn would also frame Operation Cinder on Imperials loyal to the Rebellion, and that the Rebellion had been behind the egregious acts of vile hate towards Imperial citizens. Of course, those on Naboo, Vardos, and Abandendo knew this. The planets that hadn't been seized by the Rebellion didn't know this. While Thrawn applauded the work of the Rebellion, and what they had accomplished in such a short period of time, he would not allow this Rebellion to go undermined. That was the issue so many officers had. They believed that the Empire could win no matter what. It's what cost Thrawn, Syndulla, and the Ghost Squadron at Chopper Base and on Lothal. But he assured this time around, it would not happen. Across the galaxy, the Rebellion moved on Kaminor, and won another landslide victory, at the cost of very little. Though the Rebels were winning every fight, their men and women were tired. Fighting these battles back to back to back took a toll and the Rebellion halted their movement on Kaminor. This would give Thrawn enough time to mount up a counter-offensive. He knew based on the attack pattern that the Rebels would be going for another planet victim to Operation Cinder. Within the coming days or hours, they would make another assault. This left Burning Khan, Convent, or Narcosis as possible targets. Thrawn would have to deduce which one of these three were the most likely for the Alliance to attack. Back on the Thal, a great meeting would occur. Ezra would reunite with someone he deeply loved, Sabine Wren, and he would also meet Ahsoka Tano, someone who was ecstatic to meet the son of Padme and Anakin. Luke and Ahsoka's meeting was quite poetic. It replicated how Ahsoka met Anakin and Obi-Wan for the very first time, all the way back on Christophsis. But Ahsoka could tell from her first interaction with Luke that he was so much like his father. And because Luke was so much like his father, this new order had the opportunity to become something greater than the Jedi had before. With the Jedi on Lethal, it meant that the Jedi had a place to reorganize, a place to call home for the first time in two decades. Ahsoka would stay within this order and help it. And help Luke. It was right for her to do anyways. She had essentially been killed by Vader, and Luke saved Anakin from Vader. Not to mention, Ezra saved her technically from being killed by Vader. So it would be worthwhile to repay the favor. Though for Luke, something was extremely obvious from the get-go. It was a fact that this Jedi order needed to allow attachments. Luke was able to save his friends on Bespin because of his attachments, and he was able to save his father, Anakin Skywalker, because of those same attachments. And while Professor Heyang tried to get Luke to go with the code, Luke knew better than to allow the Jedi to be destroyed because of someone with attachments. Mara found a liking for the style that Luke was going for inside of this new Jedi Order. It was something that allied with her own personal beliefs, and it would also be something that would allow for her to train with the son of the Chosen One. Everyone who connected to the Force could feel how powerful Luke was, and if given the opportunity to learn the ways of the Force like his father had, the chances of him becoming as powerful as Master Windu and as wise as Master Yoda were extremely likely. Ahsoka prompted that Luke require some 
construction droids, and they built a Jedi Academy outside the former Jedi Temple on the planet. Most of the temple was torn apart by the Empire and Vader, but it could still be seen and be used for the greater use. It was grounded and extremely well connected to the Force. Over the coming years, Luke would welcome into his order several Jedi, many of them being members of the former Jedi Order, survivors of the Purge, and even members of the Path. Some notable names would be the Jedi Wookiee warrior Gungi, a young Jedi from Yoda's species being named Grogu, a youngling survivor from the Temple, Reva, and a rebellious Jedi Master in Quinlan Vos. While there were still hundreds of Jedi lost in stars, Luke's new order had about 51 members after three years, and it was also welcoming two new members. With the order accepting relationships, Luke and Mara would welcome twins. While Ezra and Sabine eloped, they would not have any children. The council of this new order was seated with only 10 members. The master of the order was Ahsoka herself. While the Jedi were having the ability to thrive on Lothal, and even the people of Thrawthal were able to thrive, the galaxy was at a stalemate. Three years since the fall of the second Death Star, and yet Thrawn was able to keep the Alliance out of the core. The loss at Burn and Khan was terrible for the Alliance. They were caught in a trap, and while Thrawn didn't intend on letting them escape, Hera Syndulla and Lando Calrissian were able to disable the interdictors that trapped the Rebel fleet. The galaxy was stuck in an endless war. The Rebels had to fight hard for victories. Unlike when they fought an empire under the rule of Sidious, they had to fight members of an imperial military with strategic intelligence. Thrawn was at the center of it all. He had a council of military leaders that would interact with him on the daily. He ensured that this rebellion would not win but he also ensured one more thing. He made sure that Palpatine would never return. Every single plan to resurrect Palpatine was scrapped by Thrawn. So much so that he even sent scouts to Exegol to destroy the Sith Eternal in their stupid temple. The Empire would never succumb to the ineptitude of Emperor Palpatine again. And while Sidious made the Empire, he was also in control of it when it fell down. People in the Deep Core found a new sense of patriotism because of Thrawn. Because... Beforehand, the Empire had sordid victories, but now they were a real force to be reckoned with. Back in Lothal, where there was a concurrent amount of peace, Luke and Mara would have their twins, the first one being born Rey Skywalker and the second one being born Ben Skywalker. Ben was named, of course, after Luke's original master, Obi-Wan Kenobi, or as he knew him, Ben. Others may have known him as a negotiator or master hello there, but Luke knew him as Ben. Luke and Mara were most certainly happy. But this order was even more so. These were the first children born into the Jedi Order. They were the children of the Force, as Professor Hiang would discover. These two children were just as powerful as Luke's father. The genes of being the son and daughter of Luke and Mora were that of true power within the Force. Without an ancient evil or power in the Force hunting down the children of Skywalker, the Sith being all extinct, the biggest set in the galaxy were the crime lords that sprouted up in the absence of order, and of course, Emperor Thrawn. While the Jedi had been doing good deeds across the galaxy, they were still fledgling. Luke wasn't sure where to be most of the time. He wanted to help his friends and his sister, but he had an oath to the Jedi, and to those who he, as Grand Master, was supposed to train. Professor Hiang helped all the students at one point or another, and essentially became the archivist for this order, but he was still very rudimentary and needed a lot of work. Luke was a masterful Jedi at this point. He mastered harmony and he was an incredible teacher. He took a specific watch over young Jedi Padawan Grogu, but he used a lightsaber elegantly and became the spitting image of what Anakin Skywalker was meant to become. It brought a certain amount of joy, but also pain to Ahsoka. Seeing Luke thrive in this order made her wish that Anakin could have seen it with his own eyes, but she knew that Anakin knew. While this order of Jedi would work vigorously to regrow and even work alongside the Rebellion as peaceful operations, there was an issue. Since the Rebellion began to stalemate against the Empire, a lot of extremist groups inspired by Saul Guerrero rebels would begin to spring up across the galaxy. These groups would bring down acts of terror on Imperial worlds as a way to try and bolster support for the Alliance, but it never worked. These extremist groups would target civilians, and that was a bad image for the Alliance. Thrawn used it expertly as war propaganda against the rebels. Mon Mothma as leader of the rebellion would try and summon peace talks with Thrawn to see if they could negotiate anything, but Thrawn's possession of the galaxy was too strong for anyone to get any breathing room. The Grand Admiral knew exactly what he needed to do to ensure that the Empire would outlive him and of course his reign, but it was hard. 
The rebellion was pushing against the gates of the empire, but because these extremist groups, Mon Mothma needed to stop the war effort immediately. Thrawn was using the propaganda from the extremist groups to turn alliance planets against the alliance. So Mon Mothma did something she would have never foreseen. She agreed to peacefully end the war. This would divide the galaxy into lines. The Empire would have complete control over the core, with no representatives of the Alliance being able to interact with them. The Alliance would oversee the Mid Rim and the Outer Rim. And while this, again, was all strategic design by Thrawn, he intended on the Alliance breaking the peace treaty and starting war. He also intended on the Alliance being unable to govern the Mid and Outer Rim. There were thousands of more star systems out in these parts of the galaxy, and there were a lot more financially unstable planets. Thrawn and the Empire would have almost complete control over the industry, the finance, and just about all the most valuable pieces of the galaxy. Of course, Thrawn being himself intended on more extremist groups to pop up across the galaxy, and so they did. But Thrawn did not anticipate on the Jedi putting an end to these insurrectionists. The Jedi were pure of heart, and they did everything they could to stop the injury of innocence. It was never justified, and so people of the galaxy saw the Jedi as heroes. This would leave Thrawn in a very precarious situation. Because the galaxy could rally behind the Jedi, and because the Empire still held them outlawed, it could create tension within the core, especially because the Jedi were protecting the people of the core. After a year or so, Thrawn would make a judgment call, and allow the Jedi to be brought back into the core, and allow them to stop being illegal. But the Jedi wouldn't move from their home on Lothal. While people loved the Jedi, they understood why the Jedi wouldn't move back. Many people thought of the Jedi as warmongers, but because of their actions of late, they would be seen as heroes of the galaxy. Luke's Jedi Order was thriving, and it continued to work against the face of evils in the galaxy, whether it be crime lords assisting daimyos on Tatooine against the Pike Syndicate, or simply putting down Imperials who enacted terror on civilians, the Jedi were out and about. These Jedi were spread out across the galaxy as they worked hard as they could to help the people within the galaxy. Ahsoka was proud to be a Jedi once again, something she thought she'd never be able to say. Because the Sith were extinct, Luke did everything in his power to ensure that they would never return. And while the Alliance was now a political power, Luke would also train his sister. Over the coming years, both the Alliance and Empire would build up a massive force, in the realm of fleets and ground forces for the day that the war would eventually return. For the Alliance, it was still very personal what the Empire did to them. While Thrawn's Empire was leagues less manic than the Empire that Palpatine created, it was still an Empire, and people saw it as such. Though, the peace on people's minds, for the larger part of 19 years, would last. It would all boil to a head eventually. Disputes between the Alliance and the Empire came crashing down hard when a planet on the edge of the Midrim was seized by the Empire. It wasn't authorized by Thrawn, but he had to back it up, because it would be seen as weak leadership if he didn't. But the Alliance and Empire built up their military regimes to the extreme amounts of power. This boiling point could result in a war greater than the Clone Wars. Tension between both sides had been building, and it was evident that this conflict would eventually burst. With extremist groups being put to a stop by the Jedi within the 19 years, and most of the intergalactic crime being stopped by the Alliance and the new Jedi Order, there was hope that the Alliance could take over the Empire and put itself in the seat of power in the galaxy. Thrawn didn't believe the Alliance would thrive so well without war. It was a surprise to everyone that the Alliance maintained better order than the Empire did in the Mid and Outer Rims. It saw a couple of core worlds naturally change sides to join the Alliance, though the Thrawn-led Empire would push harsh restrictions on any planet that joined the Alliance. On the Thal, the new Jedi Order had seen much change. With the Skywalker twins growing up and being trained from birth by their mother and father, Rey and Ben were exceptional students. Trained by Mara and Luke, made both Rey and Ben formidable users of the Force and duelists by the time they were 19 years old. While Luke's council had seen much change, it had grown into an incredible level. The Order had just reached its thousandth member, and it was thriving unbelievably well. Luke was the Grand Master that saved the Jedi Order from being lost into the history books, while reinstating a new order that would lead its way into the future with the promise of prosperity. There were no students treated unfairly, and emotional connection and attachments were promoted. Of course, there were some members of the Order that had more traditional views towards the new Order's code, but it didn't take away from the Order itself. Luke trained every student, just as Master Yoda had done in the Age of the Republic. Luke trained wet. Luke trained Rey and Ben himself, alongside of his wife, of course, 
and with love, dedication, and hard work, the twins resembled Anakin when he were their age. While Luke had his reasons for hating the Empire, he didn't encourage the Jedi to side with the Alliance or the Empire. He believed that was a key reason for the fall of the Republic. The fact that the Jedi sided with one side or the other led to the downfall of that order. Luke didn't want the same fate to bestow his same order. But kids being kids, Rey and Ben sided with their lovely auntie Solo. Well, of course Leia and Han got married, they even had kids, three of them that is, Jason, Anakin, and Gianna. They were all trained in Luke's order, and they were very close with their cousins Rey and Ben. The Skywalker family tree saw true happiness, and while at their peak they were able to exist happily. Leia knew that this empire needed to be dragged down. While still less cynical over the passing 22 years since Endor, it was still an evil regime, led by a mastermind of strategy. Luke knew he couldn't get involved, but he would give his children his permission if they believed they could assist the Rebellion in finishing what he and his friends had started so many years ago. While Luke would have loved to help his family secure victory for the Alliance, he knew that if the Grand Master of the Jedi Order was seen infiltrating the facilities of the Empire, it could bring more harm to the Jedi than good. While it sure it was a selfish motivation, Luke spent his life essentially rebuilding this Order, and was terrified of what Yoda had to go through. Luke truly understood what Yoda meant all those years ago on Dagobah, when he said that he would be afraid one day. It was a different reason than what he ever thought it would be for, but Luke did fear an Order 66 falling down on his order. Especially since so many members had come so far since joining the ranks of his order, especially Grogu. But for now, Luke had to let his children go out into the galaxy and finish the fight that he and his sister started years before. Luke had trained Rey and Ben everything he knew in the Force, and they were incredible students and children, both wise beyond their years and established Force users. Leia would be incredibly grateful to have her niece and nephew join them on their final stand against the Empire. Reports from the Deep Core said that the Empire had the largest fleet ever seen. Luckily for the Alliance, the shipbuilders on Mon Calamari constructed a great counter to the Imperial Super Star Destroyer. Thrawn knew that the Alliance was preparing for war, and so over the years he perfected his own technological terror, the TIE Defender. These starfighters were elite to anything the Alliance had. Of course, the Rebels had new ship, but they never didn't use whatever they could get their hands on. Admiral Akbar had one of the largest fleets in galactic history under his command as well. He gave the legendary Home 1 to Vice Admiral Haldo, while he assumed the command of the first MC-90 Viscount-class Super Dreadnought, named the Radis, for the legendary battle commander at the infamous Battle of Scarif. There were three of these massive starships constructed. The Rebel fleet was primed for combat, when General Solo, still highly respected inside the Alliance, would pilot the Millennium Falcon, Lando Calrissian would pilot Lady Luck, and Hera Syndulla and her son Jason Syndulla would pilot the Ghost. A relatively new pilot would also join the ranks alongside of these legendary generals, by the name of Captain Poe Dameron. He would fly alongside a rogue squadron. The galaxy would be prepared for a massive siege. Thrawn knew it was coming. He moved all of his ships back to Coruscant, with five Super Star Destroyers surrounding the planet, numerous Golan platforms, an array of new Star Destroyers, the Empire and Alliance were primed for one more showdown for the ages. There would be no jumping from system to system, this was one battle, to end all the tension for all the power. The Alliance broke off the peace treaty the moment the Alliance fleet jumped into hyperspace. Luke sat atop of his temple in the Thal, and he felt the tension rising. He knew he should help, but his responsibility to the Jedi Order kept him grounded. He saw his wife in the corner of the room, meditating the same, as he pondered his next move. The Jedi Master next to him was a descendant of a Master of Yoda's High Council, a Baron Do Sage himself, Romo Jo Kun, told Luke to trust in the Force. It would guide him. Luke rubbed his aging beard as he pondered what to do. The Alliance fleet sat in hyperspace as Leia instructed the children on what to do. Jason, Anakin, Jayanna, Rey, and Ben had a special mission. They would have to take the fighters down onto the planet and face down Thrawn and put an end to his empire. Each of the children were trained in blaster combat, especially the solo children. Han told the children, with a smuggler's grin, that he and Hera would clear them a path. Sabine, who was with the group, smiled. Over the years, she helped rebuild Mandalore, and the Mandalorians were joining in for a final stand against the Empire. Admiral Akbar stood tall. In his old age, he addressed the Alliance in one final message before combat. He spoke through the hollow table on the Radis to every single member of the Alliance who was in hyperspace currently. He told them that this battle was for everything. 
for decades of enslavement under the rule of the Empire, for the fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters that were lost, for the planets put to ruin because of the Death Stars. This fight was for the people of the galaxy. It was for hope and it was for peace in the galaxy. The Alliance used to have to rely on small numbers and an odd chance to succeed. Now with one final stand, just like in the Age of Rebellion, the Alliance had the job of making themselves stand up against a superior force, and they would win. Admiral Akbar ended his speech by telling every single one of them to have the force be with them. As the Admiral returned to his seat, he felt his heart rate jump. It was time. Han and Hera led their group to the hangar bay as a fleet exited hyperspace. Chaos ensued as Star Destroyers could be seen strategically laying across the sight line. Admiral Thrawn sat inside of his office on Coruscant, surrounded by his best tacticians, as he placed his hand on his chin. He was going to make sure this battle was drawn out long enough for the Empire to claim a decisive victory. Just out of sight, there were several super interdictor ships. They would be brought in once the Alliance was trapped and they would bring a final destruction down to the Rebels. Thrawn anticipated everything to go wrong, and he awaited for the Millennium Falcon and the Ghost to make their move. The first fighter set in the combat would be TIE Fighters, a little modified with enough room to fit more than one member. There was a rear turret inside of every single TIE Fighter now. The Rebellion, on the other hand, launched all of its fighters. Vice Admiral Haldo mimicked everything Admiral Akbar did as he set his fleet to spread out into formation that would draw the fire from the Super Star Destroyers. The three MC-90 Viscount Star Dreadnoughts took the brunt of the heat while the Rattus stuck in the middle, drawing in the most fire. Admiral Akbar split the forces of the Alliance fleet up and sent them into combat range as they began to pepper the Imperial Star Destroyers. While the Alliance constructed a massive fleet, the Empire had mastered what Thrawn anticipated being the downfall of the Alliance. He funded several projects to construct Star Destroyers with shield generators of Mon Calamari cruisers, but the weapon systems of a normal Star Destroyer. This perfect balance would create the perfect ship to slight the Rebellion. The, the Rebels always relied on fighter-heavy offense. The TIE Defender program was created exactly for that reason. While the first wave of fighters seemed to be no issue for the Alliance, the Golan platforms and the Imperial Star Destroyers were creating tension in the Rebel lines, as an incredible space battle grew across the entire space of Coruscant. Han and Hera then boosted out of range of the fleet as they led a group of fighters down and around as Jason, Anakin, Gianna, Rey, and Ben followed closely, dodging anything and everything that came their way. Thrawn continued to study the battlefield as he planned for the moment for the last couple of decades, as he looked at the hollow table before him. He set up mines across the battlefield that were almost invisible to the naked eye, and couldn't be picked up on by sensors. The first one was set off when the Millennium Falcon was smashed with one of these mines, sending the legendary ship barreling off course. Hera noted that there were mines as Rogue Squadron moved away from the fleet to make sure that General Solo could get back to the fleet safely. The issue was that the wings of TIE Fighters were launched from the surface of Coruscant as Thrawn sprung the first trap. The Rebels were caught completely off guard, as Hera made a gut decision to push further into the surface. It seemed as if Thrawn had them beat, but in Hera's mind he wouldn't finish the job, he almost started on the Falcon. Once Han returned to the safety of the Rebel fleet, Rogue Squadron, alongside of Poe Dameron, made their move against the Imperial fighters attacking Hera and a group of Solo and Skywalker children. The Rebel heavy hitters continued hitting their marks, but Admiral Akbar realized that the Imperial fleet was supplied with ships that had heavier weapons and heavier shielding. Instead of doing what Thrawn anticipated, Akbar held back his support vessels and fighters. He knew all too well that this would be a trap set up by Thrawn. The truth is, the Alliance gave Thrawn way too much time to prepare for this moment. He was the key to this entire battle. The captains of the Imperial fleet all knew where they had to stay. They were under command of Admiral Thrawn and they didn't mess around with his rule, because the punishment was death. Akbar knew that this empire wouldn't be as ludicrous as the one he beat over Vardos and Endor. This fleet needed to be quelled with true master of strategy. Haldo made a suggestion to Akbar. She noted that the empire had mines across their battle lines. If those mines could be exploited against the empire, then the rebels had a better chance at succeeding in this battle. The issue was that they couldn't find these mines without accidentally landing on them like Han did in the Falcon. Then the plan crossed Akbar's mind as he reached out to a good friend of who might be able to help them. At the same time, Hera, the Solo children, and the Skywalker children broke past the Imperial lines. Jason Syndulla used the rear cannons to cover the Jedi to the planet. Coruscant looked much different than the era of the Empire. There were turbo laser towers scattered across the surface, and the epic palace of the Empire was built around the former Jedi Temple. 
The temple that Sidious used as a palace was expanded by Thrawn. It was to house a special project he'd been working on for some time. While Thrawn may have been relatively weak politically, as a military leader he was brilliant, cunning, and unstoppable. He prepared for anything and everything to go wrong, as a five Jedi flew through Coruscant Skyline, shooting down both TIE fighters and turbo lasers that got in the way. The five, aided by Hera and her son, blew past the security on Coruscant as the five Jedi made themselves a landing platform on the palace as they all jumped from their starfighters and entered the palace itself. Hera spun her way away from the palace as she and her son bolted back up towards the atmosphere. When she got back up, the fray had gotten significantly worse, much worse than the Battle of Coruscant during the Clone Wars. Rebel ships were dropping like flies as the Empire stood its ground. Admiral Akbar was ready to pull the fleet, and then Leia noted that there were several interdictors surrounding the battlefield. Thrawn was ready. Akbar looked around as he stood from his seat and commanded the battle group to target specific Star Destroyers, as two more Super Star Destroyers rolled around the flanks of the Imperial Lion. This turned the already three Super Star Destroyers into five. Akbar pondered for a moment as he thought on what to do. He then saw TIE advanced fighters roll around the corner as the TIE defenders locked into combat with the Rebel fighters. The Millennium Falcon and Rogue Squadron got into heated combat as Lando and Lady Luck rolled over the Raddus and engaged the fighters. Several anti-fighter corvettes got into combat with these TIE defenders, but stood little to no chance. These star fighters were tough, and it was evident to Akbar that Thrawn had spent the last 22 years waiting to embarrass the Rebellion. 22 years of peace just to destroy the Alliance whenever they showed their face again. Akbar was using his mind to think as fast as he could, especially because this battle was on the line, but it seemed as difficult as ever when the Empire was breathing down his neck. Akbar kept thinking about what Holdo suggested. It seemed as if Holdo was onto something, but then a comlink came on. It was Hera. She said she could see the mines from the Imperial side, but the issue is, is that the Star Destroyers had a greater range. They were parked right in front where they could get the furthest range. There was no way that the Rebellion could get out of this. On the surface, of course, on the five children entered the musky, quiet, and dark palace of the Emperor Thrawn. They all looked under their lightsabers as the five children stood their ground and moved quietly through the palace. The remnants of the Jedi Temple were still present. Massive pillars littered the temple. It sounded like there was evil amongst them. It wasn't just a sound, but it was a feeling. As a group moved their way through the temple itself, they confronted a sea of light. Lightsabers ignited before their eyes as they looked at death itself. Master Luke said the Sith were dead, and while he was right, Thrawn wasn't a fool. He'd been raising Force-sensitive individuals as a personal protection. He planned on the Jedi getting involved during this battle, and so he prepared as the Five moved into a defensive formation. Ben Skywalker stood at the front as the rest rallied behind him. They were all primed as they primed themselves for combat as they looked into the evil formation of Force users ready to kill them. In space, Poe cried out as he watched another member of Rogue Squadron get shot out of the sky, and then another one, and then out of nowhere a familiar voice came through, and then about a hundred more Jedi Starfighters reigned in from hyperspace. It was Mara Jade and Ahsoka leading the Jedi into combat. Akbar watched as the Jedi stormed into combat, blowing some of the TIE defenders out of the air. It was incredible. Their precise training led them to be incredible fighters. Though there was one issue, Luke wasn't present. He must have not come, but Mara passion to Akbar as she asked what the issue was. He said that there were mines everywhere and they couldn't find them on their scanners. Mara told Akbar to cover the Jedi and they would help with the mine issue. They just needed some time. Back on the ground, Skywalker and the Solo children bounced the lightsabers back and forth as they stood their ground. These Force Adepts weren't nearly as talented as they were, but the sheer size was enough to put fear into anyone's heart. The five Jedi stood back to back. Rey kicked forward as she slashed down two of the users. Gina moved forward with her brother Anakin as the two of them worked in duality, as the two close cousins, Ben and Jason, moved as a Cyclone duo of power. Rey stuck out with her yellow lightsaber as she swung skillfully around. The Jedi all used the Force as their ally until they had to deflect sniper shots from the top balcony, overlooking the battle inside the palace. The Jedi were skilled and extremely well trained, as they held their own against these Force Adepts. From the top of the balcony, a green lightsaber began to glow, as the snipers disappeared one by one. Rey moved with speed and cunning strength, as just as her brother and cousins did, but they began to backpedal as they became surrounded. From up above, a dark cloaked man jumped from the balcony and used a force as he created a massive crater in the ground, throwing dozens of force adepts from their feet as they crashed into the walls. 
Luke swung his lightsaber around as a cloak covered his head. He moved around like a tornado of power, his skills unmatched by anyone in the millennia. Rey smiled as she saw her father, and the group of five moved in on his position, as a firing line could be seen forming on the outskirts of where they were. Dark troopers lined the hallways, marching could be heard from the industrial sector of Coruscant. Luke told the five to stick by his side as he rushed forward. The five Jedi did the same as their lightsabers flickered in the wind and their robes blew majestically behind them. The six rounded the corner and split off as Skywalkers took one wing and Solos took the other wing. Their skills were incredible as Thrawn continued to send out more and more dark troopers and force adepts their way. Thrawn was still commanding the space battle above, and yet he was struggling because of the mass battle taking place in his palace. In space, the Jedi starships made their way around as they used the force to propel the mines towards the Imperial fleet. There were thousands of mines and they were all being sent towards the Imperial line formation that was sturdy and holding lines. The Jedi whipped their starfighters away as Hera shot the shot that would silence the Empire. A massive chain-link explosion that could be seen from the surface of Coruscant lit up the sky as Imperial lines were shook with the fire from in front of their eyes. The ships were weakened. Admiral Akbar saw the advantage as he told every ship in the fleet to concentrate their efforts on the Imperial Super Star Destroyers. The MC-90 discount class dreadnoughts opened up an array of firepower as they lowered their shields to stand out as much firepower as they could in a wave of destruction into the Imperial fleet. The Empire wasn't ready when their flanks were filled with disarray and confusion. Thrawn was thoroughly impressed when he heard the lightsabers get closer and closer to him, and while he could run, he knew he had been defeated. The officers in the room tried to make an escape, but when they ran into the hallways, they were met with lightsabers that were in midair being thrown through the ranks of dark troopers. Luke, Ray, and Ben ran through the doors as they saw Thrawn alone. He smiled at them gleefully. While he never thought it would come to this, he pulled an ignition switch from the table in front of him. He didn't say a word as he moved his thumb to the ignition when a yellow lightsaber was speared through his chest. Luke looked over at his daughter and grinned, but he knew she made the right choice. She probably saved everyone inside of the temple. But right now, the six needed to get back into space, or at least clear up the surface so that Mon Mothma could safely land and request that the Empire and Alliance join together in unison. The six Jedi converged on the landing platform eventually, after killing Thrawn and all of his staff. Without orders, the Imperial fleet was left in complete disarray. A firestorm of pain and destruction rained itself down on the Imperial fleet. The Alliance moved itself in for the finishing blow, as it shattered the three forward Super Star Destroyers. On the surface of Coruscant, the six Jedi sped around the city, destroying turbo laser towers exclusively, without harming citizens or innocent targets. The only target was the turbo lasers that could harm the Alliance or any members they were trying to land. While the battle in space was hefty, it was incredible. It was well fought, and when all seemed lost, the Rebellion rallied with the Jedi. They were able to secure a victory. Star Destroyers of all variations and kinds crumbled before the eyes of the Alliance. The remaining Super Star Destroyers tried to make an escape, but their attempt was futile when their engines were blown off of them and their ships were stuck from escaping. While Coruscant would be won in the coming hours, the Alliance would declare itself victor. Remaining loyal Imperials would keep the good fight going. The Jedi would go against what Luke thought was the best, and they would unite with the Alliance and help bring a peaceful transfer of power to a new Republic. This new Republic wouldn't demilitarize, as it would spend the coming months finishing off members of the Imperial Remnant. Mon Mothma wouldn't take the seat of power in the galaxy, where she would instead hand that over to Leia, whose father could have won a race against Palpatine at the height of the Clone Wars. With the Republic growing in the shadow of the Empire, Imperial Loyalists would be found and put down, as the New Republic sought to finish the job of the Alliance that it started. The Alliance brought peace to the Mid and Outer Rim, and that peace would be shared galaxy-wide. As for Luke and his Jedi Order, they would spread throughout the galaxy, Rey Skywalker taking lead of her own temple on Tython, while Ben and Jason would start a temple on the icy world of Ilum. Professor Hiang would serve side by side with Luke as he reinstated this new temple. Luke would be able to interact with his father, Kenobi, and Yoda from time to time, but it seemed he was able to keep and help bring peace to the galaxy. And let all the Jedi of the past lay in rest peacefully too. Luke and Mara would live out the rest of their lives in peace, just as Han and Leia would too. Ahsoka would take lead of a new academy of students on Dantooine, and as for Gungi and Grogu, they would return to Coruscant and start working on building an academy together. While Gungi was the older of the two, he would help Grogu finish his training. 
after centuries and the first generation of Jedi had passed away, leaving room for the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Luke and Mara and Han and Leia to take hold of the Order, Grogu and Gungi would sit atop of this peaceful Order. Grogu would sit as Grand Master and Gungi as Master of the Order. Without the threat of the Sith or the evil form or empire, the galaxy would thrive under the continuous balance, peacefulness, and happiness for decades, centuries, and the rest of time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to George Story, Benjamin Wells, Jay Hoppin, Warpig, and Thura, AC Raptor, Gort, and Chance Williams for joining us for the channel. Let's hit 2,000 likes on this video so we can see. I don't know what's coming next, man. I don't know. This story took me four days to write. We'll find out. If you want to see what if, let me know down below. Or if you comments, but don't do crossovers. Check out the Twitch community, Discord, and Patreon to be part of the community. Some more in other ways. And for the actual giveaway, go down below. There's a pinned comment. You put your name on the dock, and the winner will be found out in a video. I don't give out video. I don't win. I don't give out giveaway winners in comment sections. That's just not what I do. All giveaway winners win in videos. Remember that. Don't pay attention to the scammer. He's not a real boy. So don't pay attention to him. He's not a real boy. Anyways, let's talk about our story. So, um, <laughs> this went a complete different way than I actually ever intended on going. Uh, but when I first started running it, I realized that I had to kind of explain what happened. You know, where is this coming? Now, first things first, this is not my sequel rewrite. That will come at a later date, probably for 100k or 200k or whatever. Uh, a sequel rewrite won't happen until we're in triple digits in terms of the first three numbers, all right? So 100,000 subscribers plus uh, is when I'll probably do my sequel rewrite because you guys know how much I love putting effort into these videos and making them as long as possible. You're going to get full-length feature films. But this is not that. This is just what if Ray was Luke's daughter, right? And... I realized when I first started telling the story that I kind of needed to explain something that wasn't explained before. And that's how Luke and whoever end up having Rey. And I had to go down a long rabbit hole to get there. But it also kind of proves a point. Don't comment something stupid before you watch the video because I'm sure I'm going to get a stupid comment and it's going to be like, but you didn't watch the video, so watch the video. Now I wanted to do something here. Uh, this is something I talk to my friends about, it's something I talk about on Discord. And it's something that I, I want to try and do, it's not something that's attainable, but bring the fandom together. Right here we have a story that takes both Legends material and Disney canon material and puts them together. I'm trying to unite the fandom, uh, it's a very divided fandom, and I want we're all Star Wars fans, let's just all enjoy it, right? So what do we have here? Well we have a story that gets rid of both of them. <laughs> Again. Let's unite the fandom. Let's all come together and enjoy something we all like. We all get bullied for liking Star Wars, so let's all like Star Wars together, right? So this story is obviously taking place after uh, Endor, right? And obviously you have uh, inspiration from what we got from, I think, Star Wars Squadrons. Uh, there's inspiration from Battlefront 2, uh, those kind of campaigns that kind of collide together, and then kind of what we have as a Disney canon. And then, of course, you have characters that you know from Legends, and those characters pop up. And they're very present here, and I want to bring them together, right? You have Admiral Haldo with Akbar. I mean, I even gave Admiral Radis a son. Um, you, you know, you have Harris and Dula interacting with Lando and Luke and Leia, and it's just I'm trying to build this this nice this nice continuity of, of a Rebel Alliance, a real alliance that is working together to achieve a goal. And I believe, you know. I, I, you know, it's kind of a stretch right here where you go to find Thrawn around Ilum and then bring him back, but I kind of jumped the gun on what the Ahsoka show is probably going to do. The Ahsoka show is going to probably bring back Thrawn and Ezra, and I wanted to jump the gun on that. I don't know what's going to happen in that show, but we found out what's going to happen because we just did it, right? So what we did here is, is we just sped it up a little bit. We brought it to fruition a little bit faster. We brought, you know, Thrawn... Ezra and we brought them back and they interact with Luke and Mara and they kind of went off right and I believe that Thrawn being the tactician he is would be able to take a hold of the Empire at the fledgling that it was not do Jakku not fall for the whole let's do Starkiller base and not do the whole Exegol thing I think Thrawn as loyal as he was to the Emperor would be like well you guys lost in four years you had 20 years to thrive when I was with you guys, or 19, but essentially 20, when I was around, and then you lost in four years that I wasn't around. I'm not going to do this Palpatine stuff anymore. I'm going to do my own thing. And I think that's what he would have gone. I know he's a very loyal guy, but he's also a brilliant strategist. He's a, he's a genius, right? He's not going to just be like, oh yeah, let's just go with this contingency plan that doesn't really make all that much sense. So kind of get rid of the whole force user thing and i kind of decided that midway through the story that i didn't want there to be a sith i don't want to do a fight with palpatine i don't want to do a fight with snoke i'll save that for another day we do enough fights with snoke and palpatine and I, especially palpatine so i wanted this to be special 
Now, I think Thrawn would have been brilliant. I think I think he would have spent the entire 22 years of peace times to build up his defense, to actually think about what will happen and kind of see every possibility of what could go wrong in his against him, you know, against his favor. And I think if he had spent that time doing that, I think it would have come out to him being like, well, I have an army of Force Adepts to just defend me, I'll have the Dark Troopers defending me, and then I'll have this massive fleet. And I think Thrawn would have actually built the perfect fleet. Uh, I was very close to deciding which one I wanted to go with here, but we don't get enough stuff with the sequel characters. We get enough stuff with Luke, Leia, Lando, and I think I think if we just destroy them, I think that would have just been so awful. Um, now, as I always say, all these stories are natural. It's not really what I want. And the natural flow of the story was kind of... It looks bad for the Rebellion, and they kind of pull it out. Like, that's kind of like their whole thing. You know, it looks bad. Like, Scarif, it looked really bad, and then they got the plans, and then they were like, oh yeah, we got the plans. Endor looked kind of bad, and then they did the thing, and then it wasn't that bad. It's just kind of all the whole thing for the Rebellion. Like, it looks bad, and then they like, and then they do it, you know? So I kind of went with that theme of the Alliance kind of still sticking to the way of the Alliance. Um, but... You know, it flowed naturally and I didn't want to force anything. You know, if I force something, it could have really gone either way. It really could have. But I think Luke and the Jedi coming in to save the Alliance was really the big difference. If the, if the Jedi didn't come in to save the Alliance, I think it would have been game over and Thrawn would have won. Uh, even if, if if he died on the surface, I think he would have. I think he would have still crushed him. Um, as for the MC90 Viscount class dreadnought, that is made up. That is completely made up. It's essentially a super star destroyer for the Rebellion. I know the Viscount class is technically what it's called, but I decided to give it a name because why the hell not? And in terms of everything else, um, no no hate on, on Finn. Um, I, I'm sure I'm going to get a comment about Finn not being here. Uh, and it's not me trying to exclude Finn. I really am not trying to exclude him. But there's literally no way I could actually get him into the story. Because the First Order adopted all their kids. Like, they're like, they forced all their people into service. And because the Empire doesn't do that, I can't naturally bring Finn into the story without making it feel forced. And he'd have a name. And, I, you know, you wouldn't know who he was. I wouldn't know who he was. I just have to give him a name. Uh, I'm sure he would join the Rebellion at some point. Um, I'm sure his parents would, you know, encourage him to join the Rebellion. But in terms of him being a main character, a protagonist in the story, it doesn't really fit in without it feeling forced. Um, as for Rey, I know the story is technically supposed to be about her, and that was kind of the thing I had a hard time with. I'm gonna be honest, that was kind of the hardest part about this story is that I had so much that I had to talk about that I couldn't really get around to her. Now, if there were a sequel, or if I wanted to do this a trilogy, or do part one, part two, part three, yeah, we could have made her a main focus in part two or part three, um, but that just is something that couldn't happen here. There was just too much going on, too much I had to explain, and uh, I hope the story doesn't lack for that, because I'm sure there's gonna be people that love Rey that are coming here for a Rey story and get like five minutes of her, and I'm sorry for that, I genuinely am sorry for that, um, but the story was way too complex for me to, to, to just explain it away. I couldn't just ex mocking her into the story. I had to kind of explain how she gets there and then do a time jump and then you know I couldn't focus on her training with Luke because you're gonna be like, wait, why are Luke and Leia or why are Luke and, and Mara together? It doesn't make any sense and who are these other kids and why does she have a twin? And it, it, you know, I had to explain all that stuff and, and kind of build it up so that it makes makes sense when you're listening to it. So it's not just like, oh it happened. So on that note, I hope you all enjoyed this video. I'm going to go cry because my throat is about to kill me. This is an hour and 40 minute long recording. I hope you all enjoyed it. Stay tuned for the next video. Again, don't pay attention to the, spam the scammers. Don't comment before you watch a video. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the force be with you.